1 Samuel chapter 25. We're going to look at the entire chapter. Let's begin at verse 1 together. I'll read verse 1, get into our study, and move on into the chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 1. Then Samuel died, and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now, Samuel is a very famous, very famous individual here in, in the book, obviously, of 1 Samuel. He was a judge as well as the last judge that the nation of Israel had. And he judged something like 18 years. This is a man who, who had been dedicated to the Lord for the Lord's service and spent his entire lifetime in the temple and in his latter years was a judge there in the nation of Israel and saw great things happen. As we've been going through 1 Samuel, we've seen how that... Samuel was the one who anointed Saul, who was the very first king of the nation of Israel. We also saw how that he had anointed David, who was to replace Saul. So this is a man who was there anointing the first king as well as the second king in this mighty nation. As a matter of fact, he was there watching the nation as it grew into a military power. So he had a lot to do with the greatness of this nation, the nation of Israel. But one of the things about him that that comes to mind is the fact that in, in spite of the fact that he saw many great things, he's also one who sorrowed over the sorrowful things that took place because he's the one who anointed Saul as first king, but he's also the one who announced to Saul that Saul was going to be removed because of his disobedience. In 1 Samuel 15, 35, we read, Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. Samuel mourned every day until he died for Saul because Saul had rejected God. It isn't enough that there was great potential in this man, this king named Saul. That's not what caused him to weep and to sorrow and, and to have this great pain and grief in his life until the day he died. It's that, that Saul rejected God. And one of the things that we need to understand is those who have a righteous heart, those who have a righteous life, have a tendency of grieving for those who have rejected the Lord. And that's what happened in the life of this man and, uh, and Samuel's life. And he grieved until, until, until he died. Samuel died. And the Bible here makes it clear that the Israelites gathered together and buried him. So as is common with all men, Samuel, as good as he was, finally died. You see, some of the saddest words that you're ever going to read in your Bible are found in the book of, of, of Genesis, rather, Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, we, we read these words. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. 930 years, and he died. You see, God's intent for man was to experience beauty and joy, peace, love, to be with him forever. But because sin entered in through Satan and the temptation whereby Eve handed to her husband this forbidden fruit and, and he took of it and died, Adam was held accountable for that and, and as the father of mankind passed on his sinful nature to all men so that all of us are actually born spiritually dead. We're in need of regeneration, you see. And so when you read the Bible, when you see that God had created all things, intended a man and, and woman to enjoy them, to have pleasure, the, the peace and all of fellowship with God, and then to read the words, and he died, it gives to us an insight into what happens. The wages of sin is death. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men to die once, and after this the judgment. You see, there are those who believe that you get second chances after you die. The Bible does not teach that. I was raised in a, in a system that taught a, uh, that there was a place called purgatory, that you'd go to this place and, and that your residual effects of your sin on earth would be dealt with, purged, if you will, in this place called purgatory, where residual sins are dealt with. But we don't have, there's no such place as purgatory outside of junior high ministry. Now, that's the closest thing you're going to get to purgatory. But the bottom line is, is there's no second chances. It's appointed unto men to die once. And after this, the judgment. It doesn't say that you have reincarnation. It doesn't speak about souls being uh, transmigrated and taking up uh, residence in some other physical essence. It, it speaks simply in the scriptures as one chance to get right with God. 
one lifetime. You don't have two opportunities. You don't have an opportunity after you physically die. Either you die in the grace of God and enter into the presence of God, or you die outside of the grace of God and enter into judgment. In the case of Samuel, he died. But Samuel was a man of God who followed after the Lord. And when he died, he was buried. He was buried in a place called Ramah. He was buried in the family plot at his home. All Israel gathers together, and they mourn such a loss. The Bible in verse 1 also says that David arose and went to the wilderness of Paran. So as this was taking place, David and his men went south towards the Sinai Peninsula, and that's where he was. As you know that he's been running from, from uh, King Saul. So now he has moved. When Samuel has died, David has moved on down south into this wilderness. Now as we move on, we're introduced to a, a married couple. It says in verse 2, There was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. So what we have here... Uh, someone once, once spoke of it in this way, and therefore I call it the same thing. What we have here is beauty and the beast. You have Abigail, a woman who is of great understanding and beautiful appearance, who is married to a man by the name of Nabal. Now, when you look at these people, the, the name Abigail uh, literally means the cause of joy. The word Nabal speaks of that which is foolish or wicked. Beauty and the beast. So you have Nabal, who is described as being a very wealthy man, married to this very wise woman by the name of Abigail. She undoubtedly had an arranged marriage so that she was given to this man as his wife. So he did a lot better than he deserved when he got Abigail. And so we're introduced to these two people here as uh, individuals who are going to have a tremendous impact in, uh, in the life of David. Notice verse 4. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him, Who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all you have. Now, I have heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us. We did not hurt them nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they'll tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. Well, during this time uh, when they were shearing the sheep, as this, this is a celebration, it's a festival, a fiesta. That's when they would get together and they would... They would, they would have a banquet and, and enjoy themselves. So it was a time of celebration. David is aware of this. David's down south. Carmel is up north. And so what he says is, I'm going to send ten of my young men there in order that they might greet Nabal, in order that he might give us some supplies because our men have been taking care of, of, uh, of him and, and his, his wealth. And, and uh, it's a festival time. It's a time when people will be generous and all. So I better send ten men to collect all the goods that he's going to give to them so they can bring it back and supply us because David has an army that needs to be supplied. And so he, he sends them with a, a real courteous greeting. He, he says that they're to greet him in a, in a proper fashion. Greet him in my name, he says. Give him a blessing. Peace be to you. Peace on your house. Peace to all that you have. And re refresh his memory by letting him know that we are the ones who took care of your sheep. Nothing was ever stolen. And we took care of the people that were there guarding your sheep. We actually were guarding your people as they took care of the sheep. And therefore, if we have found favor in your sight, can you give us something because we have need? Now, that's a customary thing. David is expecting this man to respond in a, in a good way. Well, it says in verse 9, so when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away, each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat and that I've killed for my shearers and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? 
So his response is absolute rudeness. Who are these guys anyway? What are you, escape slaves? Why should I supply food for a traitor anyway, a renegade, somebody who is disloyal to the king? Why should I do any good for him when he's done so much evil to others? And that's how he speaks. Well, notice what happens. It, it says in verse 12, David's young men turned on their heels and went back. They didn't wait a moment. The minute he said that, they turned around and left. And they came and told him all these words. David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt. Nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and day. All the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, no one consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household, for he's such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. So he gives a good report. David and his men have cared for us. Something has to be done. Nabal won't listen to wise advice. You see, David's absolutely furious. He had received what had been said. His anger is provoked. He prepares his 400 men, and he's going to go deal with Nabal. Now, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 20, verse 2, the wrath of a king is like the roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger sins against his own life. And that's exactly what took place here. David is so upset. So here comes David in fury with, a, with 400 armed men and the servant is telling Abigail, your husband treated him rudely. I'm concerned for you. But he says something in verse 17 that we can look at for a moment. It says in verse 17, the last portion, for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. You know how unreasonable this man is. When he says he's a scoundrel, that is li literally he is the son of Belial. That means he is a completely worthless person. This man rejects advice. This is somebody that you can't reason with. This is somebody that has got a, 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 a proudful spirit that, that even when they're wrong, you cannot reason with this person at all. You can't speak to them. You can't bring to him anything, any logic or anything. He's not going to listen to you. Think about it before you got saved. Think about what you may have been when somebody approached you and, and started speaking to you, perhaps even a Christian, and, and started saying to you, listen, the way that you're going, the direction that you're headed is just not good for you. You're going to end up in misery. You're going to end up with lost life. You're going to end up with lost opportunities. You're going to end up just messed up. Stop. I had a friend of mine by the name of Angel. Angel and I... We're high school buddies, good friend. Angel got into taking second all, reds, downers. He took so many that something happened in his blood. And he started having bloody noses, nosebleeds. And I can still remember I was hanging around with him one night and his nose was just pouring out blood. And I said, you know, all you need to do is just, you know, apply pressure. And he says, you don't understand. He says, I've been taking so many drugs and so many reds that my blood doesn't coagulate. You've got to get me to the hospital. And you could talk to people like Angel, and you could talk to others like him, and, and you could try to reason with them, and you try to explain to them, this is going to hurt you. The way that people try to reason with me, the, the way that they would say, look, at, if you stay in the drugs, you're going to harm yourself. If you stay in the alcohol, you're going to get into a lot of problems. And, and you just blow them off. You don't want to hear what they have to say. Are you kidding? What do you know about my life? I'll be okay. You can't reason with somebody like that. Somebody who is unreasonable doesn't receive wise counsel. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. What a word is stupid. Is without intelligence. Is not a person who is intelligent enough to listen. Proverbs 23, 9, Do not speak in the hearing of a fool. He will despise the wisdom of your words. 
And you can tell him if you keep going down this path, a fool just continues to go down that path. They don't care what you're saying. And that's what Nabal was like. He was a scoundrel. No one could speak to him. And so this man comes and speaks and shares with Abigail and says, you know how he is. Well, notice verse 18. Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, so they had little ties and suit jackets on. Five seahs of roasted grain. A seah, that represents about 80, uh, rather eight gallons. Uh, a seah is eight, eight gallons, so they had about 40 uh, dry gallons of roasted grain. 100 clusters of raisins. 200 cakes of figs loaded them on donkeys. She said to her servants, go on before me. See, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under cover of the hill, and there was David and his men coming down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly, from the donkey fell on her face before David, bowed down to the ground. So she fell on at his, at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. Please let your maidservant speak in your ears and, and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name. Folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man, my Lord, men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And, and now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. The Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. So she comes and she reasons. Without saying a word to her husband, she acts wisely. And what she does is she sends a generous supply to David. Not only did she send a generous supply, but she also made her way to him in order that she might personally appease his anger by coming in a friendly manner. Proverbs 21, verse 14 says, A gift in secret pacifies anger, and that's exactly what she was doing. So Abigail makes her way to David, and as he, she does so, David is making his way down to kill her husband. And as David is on his way, he's making a strong oath that he will definitely kill Nabal. And notice what he's saying in verse 21, how he says, He has repaid me evil for good. In spite of the good David had done, in other words, Nabal has insulted me, and his inclination is to seek retribution, and he's going to annihilate every male. Now, under normal circumstances, this is not the proper way to deal with this kind of situation. Under normal circumstances, we're called to take the higher ground. And what David is doing is he's giving in to his, his carnal nature, his desire for retribution, for vengeance, and and as he's giving into it, he is, he is breathing out within himself a threatening, I'm just going to wipe this guy out and I'm bringing a curse upon myself. I am going to kill him and everybody that's associated with him. David is so upset. Uh, uh, some of us, many of us in our lifetime have been insulted and people have, have done things that, that have been harmful to us. And uh, we've had this inclination, we've had this desire to get even. That's what David has. David's saying, I'm not going to put up with this. I've been taking care of his, his, of his wealth all of this time, and this guy has a, the, uh, the ability to, to insult my messengers after we have put ourselves between them in danger. We've never taken anything, never harmed anyone. We've actually treated them well. And look at the way we're being repaid. Are you kidding me? He was so angry, he said, let's just go arm up. We're going to take him out. Here comes Abigail. She sends him all of these goods, and now she's falling down before him saying, please, don't let your anger do this. Under normal circumstances, believers take higher ground. Jesus in Luke 6, 28 said this. He said, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. 
That's what Jesus taught us to do. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus was the greatest example of this. The apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23 said it like this. For to you, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. We're, we've been taught to turn the other cheek. We've been taught to pray for those who despitefully use us. David is given in to his, his inclinations of his flesh. He is so angry, he's going to wipe him out, and he's not even reasonable about it. He is so angry. So what happens is Abigail sees him, she approaches him, she falls down before him in deep humility, pleads with him, she says, listen, he is what his name implies. He's a simple fool. He doesn't, doesn't know what he's doing. And then she reasons in this way. In verses 26 through 28, she's reasoning. She, she's basically saying, God has kept you from, from coming to bloodshed because you're better than that. And I brought you a gift. It's not even good enough for you. Give it to your men. You see, David, unlike Saul, you fight God's battles where, where Saul gets over to the inclination of his own flesh and if he feels insulted, he wants to take up arms against those that he feels is, is, uh, is a, a threat to him. You're not like him. And don't be like him, is what Abigail is saying. Don't be like him. God has better things for you. And if you go out and have bloodshed, it's going to diminish you. It's interesting in verse 29 how it says, a man is risen to pursue you, that's Saul, to pursue your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord either, that you have shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Don't bring yourself down. Don't do this. God has a plan for your life. Let God work. I was 26 once. My bride, my young wife, Marie, was pregnant with Corinne. We went and visited some people. Climbed into the car we were about to leave when she started to cry. I had started the engine, put it in gear. I was driving away from the curb when all of a sudden my little girl, 24 years old at the time, starts to cry. And I'm not talking about just, I'm talking about loud. Ooh, like her heart was broken. And I hit the brakes. I had just started to pull away from the curb which she cried, oh, and I hit the brakes, and I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she tells me, someone hurt me. And I said, oh? I sped up, made a U-turn, and went back to the house with her holding on to the steering wheel. She grabbed the steering wheel, and I yanked it so hard it pulled out of her hand, and I rolled up into the driveway and I started to take off my seatbelt because I was going to talk to somebody who just hurt my wife and I was going to speak to them in a way that he would never forget. I was going to go beat the snot out of them is what I was going to do. I was so mad. I, I, she had never seen me get angry. She had never seen me like that. But you hurt my wife? Are you kidding me? It's on. And that's the truth. <laughs> it's on. And I started to go out of that car, and she's grabbing hold of me, and she says, don't, don't, don't. She's, that's just my hormones, you know, I'm just pregnant. It's no big deal. I was sitting there, and I, was, I, I have to tell you, I was a young man once, and I had a temper. I had a bad temper, and you just don't do that. 
and you make my wife cry, I'm going to make you cry. That's just the way it is. And that's how a lot of you men understand exactly what I mean. You know what I mean. Just the switch goes off. Are you kidding me? Bang, it's on. And, and with Marie, I'm extremely protective. Oh, really? She held on to me. Don't go. Don't go. Don't go. Obviously, I didn't. I sat there for a moment. And she was an Abigail in my life. She still is to this day. She whispers into my ear, good things. Do the right thing, honey. Do the right thing. Glorify the Lord. That's the voice of an Abigail. And I have one in my life. And I didn't go in there and, and, and cause any problems. I didn't do anything. I sat there in the car. I fumed for a moment. I drove home. And the Lord ministered to me because I've had so many opportunities since then to minister to this person that I was going to go and harm. I've had so many opportunities since then. Those doors would have been closed forever. If I'd have gone in with the flesh, if I'd have gone in as angry as I was, uh, it would not have been a good thing at all. And I'd have never had a chance to, to minister to them as I have. And, to, and, and, and they asked me spiritual questions and things like that. They don't know to this day how angry I was sitting there in a, in, in a, a driveway, ready to just go in and, and uh, to beat them up, frankly, to beat them up. And you know what? I thank God for the Abigails in our life. I do. I thank God for the calm spirits and, and the heart that sees something beyond the right now. And that's what Abigail is here. Abigail is saying to him, listen, if you go out and do that, you're going to be just like Saul, a man who is busy always defending himself and always seeking for himself. David, you're not like that. As a matter of fact, this man is after you. Don't be like him. Don't be a man of the flesh. You see, we have battles that we have, guys. We have battles that we fight. And then we have the outside enemy. Yes, we have things on the outside that we fight. But there's a greater foe that I have to overcome, and that's myself. That's what's inside of me. That's my sin nature, the nature that rises up to say, look, you're not going to insult me. You're not going to insult my wife. You're not going to do that. It's that sin nature that I have to die to. At the inclination of the flesh to go and just take care of matters, just do it in, in your own strength or in your own wisdom, your own ability, your own power. And, and you have to have somebody like an Abigail. The Abigail, in a way, is like the Holy Spirit whispering into the, into the heart of David. Listen, you can be like Saul or you can be a man of God. What is it going to be? And that's a question that is still asked to this day. You can act in the flesh or you can act by the Spirit. What is it going to be? Are you going to act in the flesh or are you going to act by the Spirit? Is the Spirit of God going to move in you or are you going to act at your flesh? Are you going to get mad and you're going to take it out on people? Are you going to let them know that they can't treat you that way? Or are you going to turn the other cheek? Are you going to seek good for them even when they're doing evil to you? What are you going to do? Well, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to, to pray for those who have spitefully used you. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to transform a life to the point where you actually see eternity and not just the moment. I can get even right now, but I'm going to lose an opportunity 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now to minister to you simply because I couldn't hold back my temper for a moment and die to myself. You have to die to yourself. I started learning this lesson a long time ago when I was a young man when God started saying, either you can represent my kingdom or the kingdom of this world, but you can't do both. You have to make a choice. What's it going to be? And for me, at 26, sitting in that car, holding on, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, to that steering wheel, just angry as any young man might be because my bride there is crying, and I, you're not going to, are you kidding me? And the Holy Spirit from that point on has been working overtime in this man's life to teach me gentleness, compassion, the Spirit of God, how he moves, what he can do when you die to yourself. And Abigail's doing that. But guys, you can't do that in your own strength. You might want to. You might want to be the best person that there's ever been. You might really have a heart to be a very good person. But if you don't have the power of the Spirit in your life, if, if God is not resident within you, if by faith you haven't received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who empowers you to live a life that is godly, you're going to fail. David listened. David listened to what Abigail had to say. It calmed his spirit down. And he made it very clear. When David in verse 32 said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. Indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, 
who has kept me back from hurting you unless you had hurried and come to meet me surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal David received from her hand what she brought him and said to her go in peace to your house see I have heeded your voice respected your person a wise man according to Proverbs 1 5 will hear and increase learning a man of understanding will attain wise counsel and that's what happened now verse 36 Abigail went to Nabal and there he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunk therefore she told him nothing little or much until morning light so it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became like a stone it happened after about ten days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died there he was having a feast like a king he was partying like a rock star is what he's saying there and as he was doing that he was so drunk and so incoherent that she couldn't even speak to him I mentioned my friend Bill when Bill and I were 16 years old we went to a supermarket in Norwalk on Front Street for those of you who might be familiar with that area I don't even know what's going on there anymore but there was a supermarket it wasn't even that it was a small market Bill and I went into this market and we both stole three bottles of wine we were 16 years old we went out and drank these three bottles of wine and a friend of ours Mike Santa Maria had a 64 Chevy Impala Super Sport and he drove us to Whittier but Bill and I were so very drunk that he let us out of his car at Sierra High School in Whittier and left us there two 16 year olds on Washington's birthday drunk wandering around the streets we ended up in some backyard of some house we still don't know how we got there we were reported the police came and arrested Bill and me put us in the uh, Norwalk substation the sheriff station put us in jail we just talked about that I'm still mad at Bill because <laughs> I was so drunk I couldn't sit on the bench that they put us on and I fell down and Bill was seated right above me right above me my face was looking straight at his as he vomited all three bottles on my face yeah and I said to him stop <laughs> and he said I can't <laughs> all over me I, I still remember it and he told my one of my kids he said oh, your dad yeah he said all I know is I was fortunate enough to get the bench seat and I still remember it how cool is that how oh, I am so cool I, I used to think uh, oh it's so cool drinking and staggering around incoherently is really really a cool thing to do it's like when I started smoking I actually started smoking as a little boy but when I was about 14 I, I thought that if you just stick that cigarette in your mouth and put your mouth with that cigarette in it next to the burner there on the stove and you and you light it up and that smoke gets in your eyes and you look so rather you really are cool yeah I, and I stuck my head too close and I had a pompadour and it was filled with I had hairspray and my hair caught on fire you know and I'm standing there all cool looking like Wile E. Coyote at the age of what 14 how cool is that how cool walking around all stupid all drunk you know and that's what we did for years Bill and I were laughing over those things because look what God has done he became a policeman I became a pastor it's an amazing thing and you see that but that's how stupid you can be this man Nabal was was an, uh, a person that was so he was just so out there his wife couldn't even reason with him some of us have tried to people have tried to reason with me when I was a kid and I was a drunk and there's no reasoning with a drunk you can't you cannot present to them anything that makes sense they'll just look at you and agree with you or, or fight you you know or whatever that's what they do I mean you could argue with me all day long when I was drunk and I go uh, what do you know you know and and I wouldn't listen to you it's just not worth it. that's why she comes home and there he is a fool and he's all partying and everything and and his friends are all like a king but the next day she says oh by the way 
while you were busy being drunk, I stopped a man with 400 soldiers who was going to come and kill you because of what you did. What's he do? <gasps> Boom. He's on the ground. And the Lord takes him home. Now it's interesting, not takes him home. The Lord killed him. He didn't go home. Anyway, it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. David heard that Nabal was dead. He said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. In other words, vengeance is mine. I will recompense, saith the Lord. David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David sent us to ask you to, ask you to become his wife. She arose, bowed her face to the earth. Here's your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. Nabal died as it was appointed unto him. He died. You can accumulate so many material possessions over the course of a lifetime. You can even party like this, like he was, like a king. But ultimately, you die. Ultimately you, let, ultimately, you die. You leave everything behind. Jesus said it this way. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You can get caught up. You can get caught up with this, this lie that you're, you, know, you can have what you want. All you need to do is go out and buy it and buy it on a payment plan. And then when you do, you end up paying for the rest of your life. You end up making payments after payment after payment, and if you're a little bit late, then they jack up your interest rate to 19.8, 21 point whatever, and that's what happens. They get you sometimes, unfortunately. They can, they can give you this credit card and start you out at 3.9, but if you're a day late, it goes up to 19.8, and you never get out of that. And a lot of people have been trapped by this desire to have the material things now, the wealth now. You know, I get married, and uh, our furniture is... Uh, is a $99 TV set and a $10 couch. We don't have a bed. What we have is a, a rollaway that we use till I'm able to afford $25 a month to, actually $20 a month to purchase a water bed. And that was pretty much it. That was, that's as far as we were going to go. I mean, in terms of like going out and buying lots of stuff, why, why would we get married and be in debt at the same time? Why would we do that? But a lot of people are. A lot of people spend so much money on their, on their wedding itself, the $50,000, $70,000 weddings. And they just put it on the card. They expect mom and dad to pay for everything. And they even send out as many as, many as uh, announcements and as many uh, invitations because they're, they're saying, well, I sent out 500. That means everybody's going to bring me a gift or give me some money. And that's how a lot of people think. It's almost as if their wedding is it's an affair that they're going to profit from. And that's how a lot of people think today. It's unfortunate, but it's true. It's true. I've told my kids, listen, you can have an expensive wedding or you can have a great honeymoon. What do you want? But you can't have both. You can't have both. You can have a nice honeymoon or you can have an expensive wedding. What do you want? You're not going to get both because we can't afford that. I'm not going to go broke for you. Listen, get the license. Oh, I'll marry you here in the backyard. We'll have a barbecue. I'll let you swim in the pool, no problem. And I'll rent you a room for the night. <laughs> no big deal. You know what I'm saying? I mean, greed can get to you. Materialism can get to you. This man had, had it all. He had so much, and they told us how much he had. He had so much, and the minute, the minute that it was time for him to die, he died. That's it. There's nothing you can do. And he goes into eternity without God. There's nothing you can do. That's why you better make sure that you're right now. There are no second chances. You better make sure you're right with the Lord now because it's appointed unto men to die once and after this, the judgment. That's why. And in this case, Nabal dies, but that leaves Abigail. And David was so impressed by Abigail, he said, go get her and ask her to be my wife. She says, I will be. I'll wash the feet of the servants. And that is a great woman who said, I will be this man's wife and she comes to be his wife but notice verse 43 and 44 David also took Ahinoam 
of Jezreel. Both of them were his wives. And Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. You're supposed to marry one woman, David. You got too many, too many wives. Hard enough to be married to one woman. You don't want to, you don't want this, David. <laughs> you don't want this. But that's what he did. Does God, does God um, in, in the Bible, did God say it's okay to have more than one wife? God allowed, but God did not design marriage to have more than one husband and one wife. God gave Adam one woman, Eve. The first person to have more than one wife was a man who was not a son of God. This is a man who was actually a sinful man. God permitted it, but God did not ordain it. And in the New Testament, when God gave qualifications for a leader in the church, he said that this leader be a husband of one wife, and that set the tone that made it very clear in the body of Christ, one man and one woman for one lifetime. God did not say that polygamy was his plan. He allowed it, but it ceased in the New Testament. You don't see it in the New Testament. You see it only in the Old. And it was by, by um, God allowing it, but not by design. But you're going to see what took place because he had more than one wife and the trouble that comes as we continue our study in First Samuel. Our Father, we ask that you would continue to work in us Lord, we know that you have a way that you want to work in us, and therefore we ask that you would have your way in us, Lord, that we would be those who serve you with all of our hearts, Lord, and be aware of the fact that, that our old nature is constantly rising in opposition to the work of your Spirit. And I'm asking now, Lord, that you would work within the hearts of many in this room right now who need to get right with you. Our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed. And I want to give an invitation today, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it in an open fashion. Normally I'll ask you just to raise your hand, but today I really, I really believe that the Lord would have me to give an open invitation. In other words, give you an opportunity, if you need to get right with God today, to in a moment stand and to come and stand in front of this platform and openly say yes to Jesus Christ. I want to give an open invitation this morning. Some of you need to get right with the Lord, and you know the Spirit of God has been speaking to you. And so I'm going to ask you in a moment as we stand and worship the Lord in song to slip out from where you're standing and come and stand and humble yourself and stand here in front of this platform and say yes to Jesus Christ. Yes, I need to get right with you, Lord. You may be a backslider. You may be a person who's never opened your heart to Christ. Either way, today's your opportunity to openly confess Christ. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. So I give you an opportunity to openly say yes to him, to come and stand in front of this platform as we worship. When the song concludes, to so pray with me a simple prayer, opening your heart to Christ and spending a moment with one of our follow-up counselors after service who will share with you a few things that you need to know. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you, I'm going to ask you, to take courage, step in faith, come forward and say yes to the Lord and get right with God today. Father, I ask that you bind the enemy. I ask that you set the captive free. And Lord, you receive all glory for any work that's done because it's to you they're coming, Lord. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.